you looked at me at all, I was fiddling with my phone before we got going here. And, of course, I don't like to do that. But um, I did it because I remembered a verse that I wanted to share with you before we get into this. Because today we're talking about death. We're talking about what happens after we die. And um, I've spent, I've really been reading this book for a couple of years, and I finished it this week. Uh, it's called Devotions for Emergent Occasions and a Sermon Called Death. Duel by John Donne, written in the 1600s. And uh, it's just, it's been a devotional guide for me. A wonderful man, godly, and just quite a, quite a rascal in his time, too. But his, uh, his last sermon in it is called Death's Duel. And it was uh, the last sermon he ever preached. And it was carefully written down and preserved now. Um, it was specially requested by him. And he died a couple of weeks afterwards. So he's a man who preached his funeral sermon. And his sermon in its entirety was an exploration of Psalm 68, verse 20. And it was in the King James Version. So that's why I was on my phone looking for the King James Version. Because I wanted to read it the way he read it. And the, the verse is this. It's Psalm 68, verse 20. He that is our God is the God of salvation. And unto God the Lord belong the issues from death. There's a couple of things I want to say about that. The first thing is that the word salvation, although we've translated it in our modern way of translating it in a singular sense, as if God is the God of me going to heaven when I receive Jesus, but it's actually a plural, uh, a plural word. In other words, God is the God of our salvations those ones that happen throughout our lives and throughout our lives as we face death and as we face hard things. And then um, he concludes, the, the, he preached a whole sermon on this, and he concludes this verse by saying, unto God the Lord belong the issues from death. This is another fascinating word to, to really look at and tear apart. He's talking about the exits. This is the Hebrew word for exit. Or border. Unto God belong the exits related to death, if I was going to put it all into our, our words. So what uh, Don argued in this, and what I believe and what we'll see today, is that God is the almighty, sovereign Lord over every issue surrounding your death. When it happens, how it happens, whether it's long and prolonged after an illness or a disease, whether you die in your sleep, whether you suddenly die. And he is also the God of the exits of, uh, uh, of, of your life and, and, and exits related to death in that he is sovereign over what happens to your and mine body after we die. He's sovereign over your body when you, whether you die, you know, how, how, whatever tragic way you might die and whatever might happen to your body, he's sovereign over it. He's sovereign over every cell of your body, and when he resurrects your body, he will call all of those cells, wherever they may be, to your body, because he is sovereign over all of the ways that we die, and everything related to that. So with that being said, let me uh, jump into our text today. It's, on, it's from 1 first, uh, Thessalonians chapter 4. We're going to be looking at verses 13 through 18. And uh, let's read that together, and then I'll pray, and we'll dive right into it. That's 1 Thessalonians uh, 13, chapter 4, 13 through 18. And let's just take a moment and gather ourselves as we uh, approach the Word of God. Paul writes, but we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we 
who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Gracious King, we seek your comfort this morning. Nobody in this room has uh, lived a life unaware of death, and most all of us have certainly encountered grieving over death. And uh, we are like our brothers and sisters in Thessalonica. We grieve at death. We seek to grieve differently. We try to than the world around us, but nonetheless, we grieve, and so we have questions and concerns, and we pray that our hearts would be calmed this morning as we consider those. We live in a world in desperate need of you. We pray that we would begin to love that world with just a fraction of the love that you have for it. We think this morning of the victims of uh, the horrific earthquake in Morocco with over 2,000 people killed yesterday. And uh, we pray, Father, for those people's lives. We pray for the medical people serving to take care of them, for the people that they are still extricating from the rubble. Uh, and we pray that through it all, somehow in it all, the love of Jesus Christ would shine uh, on these dear people. We ask all of these things along with the desire and the expectation of your Holy Spirit himself filling us at this moment empowering us to receive your powerful word. We trust you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, the big idea that I'm talking about today and that we're going to cover is, is simply this. We will meet again on the far side of death and be together forever with him. We will meet again on the far side of death where we will be together forever with him. The context of our passage is that Paul is separated from a church that he started a few months prior. He's in uh, Corinth, Greece, which is southern Greece, and he's writing to a church in Thessalonica, Thess Thessalonica Greece, modern-day Saloniki, and it's in the north of Greece. And he started a church with these people, and they had tr a tremendous success. There are people coming to the Lord from the Jewish background and Gentile background, and, and it, was, it was really great, and he loved this church. Was, this is the most positive couple of letters that he wrote to any church, and um, along the way, um, I believe it was Timothy was sent to them to kind of figure out how they were doing and help them, and Timothy came back to Paul and met him and said, they're worried about their friends and family members who are believers in Christ who have died, are dead and buried. Um, it appears that the, the Thessalonian church was completely comfortable with the fact of Jesus physically returning to the earth. But their question was, what if he returns when I'm dead? How, do, how does that fit into it all if I'm, if I'm dead and if I'm a cor corpse? They expected him to return at any moment then. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul writes to answer the question, what if he returns when I'm alive? <laughs> and he explores that issue. But here, for the sake of the Thessalonians, he's answering this question, what about if I'm dead? And they were apparently struggling and grieving uh, with this issue. So there was a question, the fate, about the fate of those who had died while believing in Jesus. What will happen to those of us who are dead and buried when Jesus returns for his church. Paul says, we don't want you to be uninformed. That word means ignorant. Uh, we don't want you to, be, to, to not have the knowledge that you need. That's important. Because it tells us that there is a logical and propositional truth. There are, there's a teaching here that we are to receive in order to translate into our emotional response to death. Um, Paul didn't just get a Hallmark card 
or flowers and send it to them, although those things are beautiful gestures. He wrote truth to them because it's what they, what they needed. And he did not want them to be uninformed. That's important. We shouldn't ever approach a text of scripture like this where Paul says something like that, I don't want you to be uninformed, and then walk away from it uninformed. <laughs> we, should, we should approach the scripture and, and think, okay, I'm going to be informed here. I've got to crack this nut, <clears throat> nut and figure out what it is. But the purpose is that I would be educated by this. And he talks about those who are asleep. This is a euphemism. It's a word in place of the word death and buried, I guess. <clears throat> those who are asleep. The ancient world did, did use the word sleep to describe death. Um, it wasn't just coined by Christians. And um, it's, it's interesting. The ancient world used it to describe a, a person ceasing from being fully conscious and, and, and dying, although they really didn't play the word out at all the way Paul did. Paul intensified this word by describing it concerning those, who cry, those in Christ as something that will be their state before they wake up. And the ancient world never thought in those terms. When we see somebody sleeping, we don't walk into a room. If I walk into a room and Sharon's taking a nap or something, I don't go, I wonder if Sharon's dead. And, you know, run up and check her pulse or something like that. She's sleeping, okay? And that's what I, what I assume. And when we see people like that, we think they're asleep. The implication is they're going to wake up. And so Paul, you know, in using that word, and Jesus did it too, it really changed the meaning of the word in a much, much deeper way. And he did it so that they would not grieve. Uh, as we grieve, we still grieve today for the deaths and the loss of people that we love. He didn't want them to grieve in a certain way. He didn't want them to grieve the way people grieve around them and the way people grieve around us when they're facing the issues of their own mortality and death. I read an interesting article in the Guardian uh, British newspaper yesterday, and it was about, um, oh, I think it named 15 of the world's richest entrepreneurs and wealthy, wealthy people, especially from Silicon Valley, who had invested hundreds of millions of dollars in life-extending research. Everything from cellular research to plasma blood transfers to, I mean, just all of their money is going into it. And they are, at least in one area, some of the smartest guys around. And they are desperate about death and spending lots and lots of money about it. Strangely enough, they're not just spending the money, it said in this article, so that they will live longer, although many of them have health issues that spurred them to really want to invest in this. Strangely enough, the big motivator is the personal glory that they will receive should they break through and be able to add years onto the human lifespan. They're really working on it. Well, we are not to fear death the way they do. And we're not to grieve at the, in the face of death the way of the world around us. Let me read some things that um, have been found in the literature and graffiti of the ancient Roman world that deal with, with death. Um, in Thessaloniki itself, they found an inscription that says, After death, there's no reviving. After the grave, there is no meeting again. The Greek poet Theocritus wrote, Hopes are among the living. The dead are without hope. A woman in ancient e Egypt named Irene, uh, something she wrote was found here. It's a letter she wrote, a note. It's, it's Irene to Taanophorus and Philo, good comfort. I was grieved and wept over the departed one as I wept for Didymus. And all things whatsoever were fitting, I did. And all mine, Epaphroditus, and Thermuthion, and Philion, and Apollonius, and Plantas. But, nevertheless, against such things we can do nothing. Therefore, therefore comfort ye one another. A Latin poet uh, in, in, in Rome, uh, Catullus, wrote, Let us live and let us love, the suns can set and then return again. But for us, once, we, uh, once, we are, we, once our brief light sets... There is but one perpetual night through which we must sleep. 
Isaiah the prophet wrote, on the mountain of the Lord, and this is a mountain of God's salvation in a day with the return of the Lord. That's what it's representing. And he wrote in chapter 25, on this mountain, he will swallow up the covering, which is over all the people, even the veil, which is stretched over all the nations. That veil is death. And whether it's Silicon Valley and people throwing millions of dollars at the problem, whether it's people living in fear of it, uh, whether, it's, whether it's Thessalonians struggling with the issue and people of the ancient Mediterranean world concluding that they must console themselves that life and striving truly is over upon death. And they had no concept of a physical resurrection either. So whether it's any of those things... Um, that's hopelessness. And this is where Christianity broke into this culture and just exploded with hope and light and truth. It actually spoke of being resurrected from the dead and it actually followed a man who had died and three days later resurrected from the dead. So it changed the whole world, of course. Okay, the answer to the question, what happens to those who I die, those who have died and are in the grave when Christ returns? There's four main things that Paul says about it. Um, there is a, we are to look forward to a return, a resurrection, a rapture, and a reunion. See, I can still alliterate when I need to. Yeah, you get those R's, you see what I did? <laughs> a return, a resurrection, a rapture, and a reunion. First thing that Paul writes about that is that Jesus will return with the souls of those who have died in him, okay? Those who have fallen asleep in Christ. That means Jesus is not returning with, if I die, my flesh and blood body, um, and, and I'm not coming with him, but that his return will be first involved with the souls of those who have died, the spiritual life. Because when you and I die as Christians, we go to be with the Lord, but not our bodies. He will return with our souls. Uh, that will be the great return that we, that we look for. And Paul assures them, don't worry about it. You will not meet Jesus before your father who has passed away meets him. You will not experience if you're alive, a sudden change of your body to become immortal, you won't experience that until they have been resurrected from the grave. And uh, it, it, it gets more exciting. Those bodies in the grave, they could be in the grave as bone. Sometimes I get too literal, so stop me if I'm getting too literal. But I mean, I'm finished reading John Don talking about the worms and, the, and all of this with death. But um, regardless of the circumstances, the exits of your death that God is in control of, since he is control, he will draw your body together. If your body decomposes and, and is scattered in a molecular sense of carbon and everything else all over the face of the earth, uh, the same God who took the dust of the earth and breathed into it to make a body will be able to call forth immediately every particle of dust that is you and resurrect you. This is how great God is. So we don't worry about it because those who have fallen asleep in Jesus, regardless of their state physically, they will be resurrected. And those who have died will be the first ones raised. Um, Paul goes on and talks about Jesus resurrecting all those who have died in him. The Lord will descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. There's great teachings and studies on, you know, what's the meaning of this trumpet? What's the meaning of this voice? What's the meaning of this com command of Christ uh, and this archangel's voice? And they, they're fascinating and they are distinct. But what I see them all saying is they're all commanding because of what happens when they do that. They are all commanding the dead in Christ to rise because Jesus is returning for his bride. That's why he's returning personally. There's another time when he does set foot on the earth 
and he sends angels to get everybody. And, and it's a kind of a different, different kind of a situation. But in this one, we have the most astounding picture of Jesus in the air calling his bride to himself. You are that special to him. The Thessalonians were that special that he, through trumpet, through call, through command, called his bride to himself. And then uh, Paul goes on and says, we, then we who are alive and remain will be caught up. We will be what's called raptured. Okay? Um, so I'll say a few things about that. I'm not going to duke out the whole, the whole uh, battle that we have about it. But I will tell you something. So I guess I am duking it out a little bit. I will tell you something, though. It is not a new thing to take a prophecy of God and belittle it or argue against it because of how silly it sounds. Okay? When people talk about rapture, of course there have been terrible movies with raptures in them, and that hasn't done us any favors, right? But uh, nonetheless, there's this thing called rapture, and um, the, the, the rapture, and people have had a hard time with it. They said, oh, what can you think? Like all of a sudden there's going to be piles of all of our clothes sitting there. And I remember posters from when I was growing up of jet airplanes crashing into buildings and, and people getting jettisoned on up, you know, and it was just, it was some pretty wild stuff. Pretty great poster, too. I don't know, I don't know how theological it was, but, it, but wow, you know. Uh, so it can be made fun of and doubted on the basis of how illogical and bizarre and extreme it is. But I want to tell you something. The group of people who disagreed that there could be a resurrection, a physical resurrection, like what we're talking about, amongst Jesus' day was the Sadducees. And one day they came to Jesus and they said, we got a, we got a problem for you here. Uh, there was a man who had a wife and he married her. And then he died. No children. And then his brother came and married her. That's, that's called a leveret marriage. It's a part of the Jewish culture, the way they would do it. And the second brother came and married her and she died. And then the third brother came and married her and she died. And the fourth, and the fifth, and the sixth, and the seventh. All seven brothers married her, and then they died. Now, in the, uh, in the, in the heaven, in the eternal state, who's going to be her, her husband since all of them were married to her? And Jesus explained on the basis of one word, of. God is the God of Abraham. God is the God of Isaac. God is the God of Jacob. Therefore, don't mess with me about the resurrection. It certainly is a living God, and those men are certainly alive. So my point is, attacking a doctrine or a theology on the basis of how silly or unlikely you can make it is not a new game. That's what they threw at Jesus. Gave him a silly scenario and to, to try to destroy something that was true, the resurrection. So I believe in this stuff, the rapture. Um, from the New Testament Greek, it's the word harpazo. And that is a word that simply means to suddenly snatch something up. Uh, it is not a gentle word. It's, it's not a word that kind of says, well, by progressive stages, you might possibly harpazo as you float away or something. No, it's, it's grab it. It's, the, it's a word we get rap, uh, the, the raptors from, you know, those cool looking dinosaurs and, and, and stuff. In other places in the Bible, the same word describes a thief carrying off a person's property. It describes a bird snatching away a seed that, was, that fell on the sidewalk instead of the garden. It describes the intentions of crowds to take Jesus by force and make him their king. Same word. It describes a, a wolf coming to a flock of sheep and snatching one of them away. It describes, same word, the inability of anybody to snatch out of the hand of the Lord somebody that the Father has given to the Lord. It describes Paul being snatched up to the third heaven. You see what I'm saying here? This is a sudden intervention of God that does remove a person in, in, some, in some sense. And it's also consistent with how God operates anyway. It's not a new, new idea that God would intervene in human history and physically remove people before judgment or simply for his purposes. Uh, he can snatch up whoever he wants, whenever he wants, and however he wants. 
He can snatch up Enoch, a man of the ancient pre-flood world, who he snatched up before a judgment came in the flood. He can snatch Lot by angels showing up and dragging him out of the city of Sodom and Gomorrah before judgment rained down on it. He can snatch Israel out of Egypt for their deliverance, snatch them out in one night. He can snatch Rahab out of the city of Jericho before the city fell to the invading Hebrew army. He can snatch Elijah in a flaming chariot and take him to heaven. Why can he do that? Because he's God. And he can do it the way he wants, when he wants, and how he wants. He um, can snatch up Philip on a road south of uh, Jerusalem. He can snatch him up by the spirit, by his spirit, and Philip can find himself in another city miles away. Same word. Same word. So Jesus will, uh, coming to earth, reunite the souls of those who have died with their bodies. And I don't think it'll be long afterwards because Paul's always talking about, you know, the twinkling of an eye and all that. But after that, he will change those of us who live, basically changing our bodies. Instead of bodies that are wearing down and could die, they become the eternal bodies. Uh, doesn't say a lot about that, so I won't either. But that's what happens in this event called the rapture. It's not presented as a secret. It's presented as being sudden. Uh, and how the world deals with that. Oh, I've got some speculation on, on that issue. But that's what the Bible, uh, the Bible says. And finally, Jesus will reunite his church with each other and with himself. We will be reunited with one another. I miss my mom. I miss my dad. I miss my grandparents. I mean, I miss so many people. More and more as the years go by. Heidi misses her mom. She shared with us. And of course you miss people who have gone on. And um, we will be reunited. We will see each other again. Um, we'll be together again. And more importantly, we will be with Jesus. Paul wrote... He'll bring us together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall always be with the Lord. So, this is an astounding truth. I mean, this is really something. Paul concludes by saying, therefore, comfort one another with these words. Comfort is in the present tense. He's, it, so it's really not something to, to, where, to where we say, well, you know, make sure and teach on the rapture. So that when somebody dies, everyone will know everything's fine and they're going to be raised or something like that. It's a, a, an exhortation for you and I to continually be reminding one another of the countercultural, unworldly truth that we are going to rise after we die at the command of Jesus Christ, that we will see each other again. That's why we got to be nice to each other now. <laughs> and we will be reunited with Jesus Christ forever, okay? So we encourage one another, and the word really means keep on comforting each other with these words, in our grief, okay? With these words, the truth of God's word. Listen to this quote from an old Bible guy named J. Vernon McGee. He said, the primary purpose of this passage is not to teach a scheme of prophecy, but rather to instruct us on how to provide encouragement to one another when we face loss and death. The dead will be resurrected and will participate in the Lord's coming for his own, his church. When Christ comes, the living will be reunited forever with their loved ones, and they will all be with the Lord eternally. Too many of our funerals are, really are nostalgia-based, um, I mean, you've seen it and I've seen it. And I hope there's a great slideshow for my funeral. I got to be honest with you about that. Uh, I hope there's great music and, you know, I hope everybody's crying and then having a nice meal and feeling better about it. I'm just being honest with you. Um, so, but, but we do get nostalgic, don't we? We get pretty nostalgic at funerals. And that's okay. That's a part of it all, to remember the significance of the person's life. But we... Having Christ, we got more to say. 
That's why at funerals, any funeral that's, that's worth, its, worth attending, I should say, uh, gives you the hope of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I've preached a lot of funerals for a lot of Christians, and I've preached a lot of funerals for people that are not Christians. And when I first started doing that, preaching at a non-Christian's funeral, I tried to preach in a way that would please my non-Christian friend who had died. Or you, you know what I mean? Isn't that strange? I wouldn't want to offend anybody, but why would they want me to do it if they didn't know what I was going to say? I mean, everybody knows Kenny's going to talk about this, so, you know. So I learned that the people attending the funeral drink it up when you speak of the hope of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We can encourage each other with, with these very, very words. And the reason we speak confidently relies simply on the facts of Scripture. The death and resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ. You struggle with the idea that Jesus would appear and that we would meet him in the clouds and be together forever. Well, then you must really struggle with the fact that he was in the clouds taken from the earth. And you must struggle that after he was resurrected, he walked through walls. You must struggle that his mother got pregnant with him without ever sleeping with a man. You must struggle with a whale that her it was that swallows a guy for three days and then burps him out on the, on the beach because God told him to. You must struggle with a Red Sea being separated in such a way that the sand was dry and the nation of Israel walked across it. I mean, all of those miracles in the Bible, you need to just own them. It'll drive you nuts if you try to pick, pick out which ones make sense to you or not. This is the word of God. And this is why you can believe that you will be uh, reunited with Jesus. We will suddenly meet again on the other side of death. And we will be together forever with him. I want to conclude with a, a song that I love. And um, you're probably wondering if I'm going to sing right now. I'm not. It's by the Stanley Brothers, and it's a beautiful bluegrass song. And it goes like this. Uh, it's, it's called Death is, Death is No More Than a Dream. Sadly, we sing and with tremulous breath as we stand by the mystical stream in the valley and by the dark river of death, and yet tis no more than a dream. Only a dream, only a dream of glory beyond the dark stream. How peaceful the slumber, how happy the waking where death is only a dream. Why should we weep when the weary ones rest in the bosom of Jesus supreme, in the mansions of glory prepared for the blessed, for death is no more than a dream. Gracious Father, we thank you that if death is no more than a dream, thank you for giving us the beautiful dream with a good ending. Thank you for the wide river that we will be carried across for the western shore where the sun sets on an entirely new land. Thank you for our experience that we will have of leaving, of knowing that we will be raised, of knowing that we will see those we love in Christ. We will see them and love them and hug them again. And thank you that the plan is and always has been that Jesus calls us from the dead so that we can be together forever with him. We worship you and we entrust the exits, the issues of death to you and you alone because you are the God of the living. Now bless us to believe this. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.